Good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, for a new IAA colloquium from the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And uh, today we will have the presentation by Dr. Giuseppe Morello from the IAC. From Good morning, Instituto. everybody. Welcome uh, for a new IAA colloquium. There is an echo. From uh, Dr. Giuseppe Morello from the Instituto de Astrofísica de Canarias in Spain. And he will talk about uh, holistic approach to exoplanet spectroscopy. So now uh, Dr. Morello will be properly introduced by Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Thank you, Rene. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here or on online in this new Zavirtua uh, Colloquium. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having um, Dr. Giuseppe Morello. So thank you very much for having accepted our, our invitation. Giuseppe Morello uh, graduated with the highest uh, degrees from the University of uh, Palermo uh, with a Bachelor in Physical Science in, in 2010, followed by a Master in Physics in, in 2012. Afterwards, he made his PhD thesis at the uh, uh, University College in, in London in, in, in two years, in 2016-17, as far as I have here in, in the lead bio. And, and in those years, he perfected blind signal source separation, so this is called BSS, and both are also non-BSS techniques, obtaining outstanding results from the analysis of exoplanet systems observed with the Spitzer and, and HST, the Hubble telescope. During his PhD, he also won the prestigious uh, IPAC fellowship to carry out a machine learning classification project on all sky surveys working at Caltech for uh, six months. He has held numerous uh, seminars in Europe and the United States and an invited talk uh, to a splinter, a splinter session at the IAU in 2015. Uh, in the period 2017-2020, he obtained a postdoc at uh, COA in, in, in France, partially engaged in the H2020 Exoplanets A program laid by Dr. Pierre-Olivier Lagache. At uh, COA and at UCL, uh, he specialized in the modeling of the stellar limb darkening and other astrophysical effects, effects also contributing to uh, three PhD thesis. In 2020, he won a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship for the ExoMac project, which he leads at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias together with uh, Dr. Uh, Enrique Payet. He has recently won an aerial fellowship at Chalmers uh, University, where he is continuing the Exomac project, which is renamed as ET Cafe. His scientific interests are focused on the exploitation of multiple observing techniques for exoplanet atmospheres, with emphasis on the synergies between low and high resolution spectroscopy. He has also actively participated in the validation of over 24 new exoplanets and refining the mass measurements in several system, uh, systems. He participates in space-based uh, projects like Ariel and Plateau Consortia, uh, the uh, James Webb uh, Space Telescope Transiting, uh, Transiting Exoplanet Community, ERS program, and also in ground-based collaborations like, like Harmonis and Mosca 2 with important contributions to the discovery and characterization of many exoplanet systems. Today, he's talking about, uh, uh, as you see, the holistic approach to exoplanet spectroscopy. Thank you again, Giuseppe, for being here, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you uh, for uh, coming here, and I'm very happy to accept uh, uh, the invitation to present uh, my work uh, here today. Uh, I will, uh, uh, so the title of my talk uh, is uh, Holistic Approach to Exoplanet Spectroscopy. I will present uh, uh, what I'm doing now and uh, what I did in the past uh, few years. Uh, okay, so there is a, a brief introduction for uh, people that uh, are from different fields. Uh, uh, what I work uh, mostly are transiting exoplanets, that are planets that pass uh, in front uh, and or behind uh, their stars for a part of their orbit. And uh, they are revealed uh, through a, uh, through a uh, flux drop uh, when they occult part of the stellar flux. 
that uh, uh, is uh, roughly proportional to the uh, area ratio between the star, uh, the planet, and the star. And uh, also, when they pass uh, behind the star, uh, there is uh, the flux coming from the planet that is occulted, and uh, we can uh, measure it. And in more in general, uh, when the planet orbits, uh, the total flux coming from the star plus uh, uh, planet system vary during the orbit, and uh, it reveals different portions of the uh, planetary uh, emissions uh, with different uh, viewing angle. And uh, in particular, I uh, analyze the atmospheres. Uh, so the, the light that passes through the um, thin annulus around uh, the planet that is uh, its atmosphere to characterize the chemical composition, thermodynamics, uh, and transport uh, processes. Uh, just a uh, 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 quick numbers that I uh, don't explain in detail, uh, but to have an idea of what kind of precision do we need for these studies. Uh, if we consider uh, the atmosphere as an annulus uh, with uh, a few atmospheric scale eight of amplitude, and we want to calculate the contribution uh, to the, the amount of flux occulted by just the annulus, uh, we can measure the atmospheric scale eight, which is given by the formula kT over mu g, so it's proportional to the temperature and inversely proportional to the gravity and the molecular weight of the planet. And uh, uh, if we make this calculation for uh, some solar system planets like the Earth, we find uh, uh, an effect that is below, uh, that is in the last column of the table, uh, and it is below 10 uh, to the minus six, so very uh, tiny effect. Even for Jupiter, uh, we have an effect uh, at the level of uh, um, seven uh, parts per million, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, what makes uh, this kind of study possible for exoplanets is that uh, many of them are very hot, uh, much hotter than uh, uh, our solar system planets. And they are in close orbits. And uh, uh, so they have a very higher signal on the order of 10 to the minus four, for example. <laughs> Uh, and uh, this is, uh, in general, the photometric precision that uh, uh, we need. Uh, now, if uh, we consider pure geometry, assuming a star with a constant uh, um, uniform flux distribution, uh, this is more or less what we would observe. So a nearly trapezoidal model uh, for the flux. But uh, uh, in practice, the observations are dominated by other effects, uh, mostly instrumental systematic effect. Uh, these are some uh, light cures from uh, Spitzer that you on the top and uh, uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and uh, apart, so they are dominated by instrumental systematic effects, but there are also other astrophysical effects such as uh, standard limb darkening. Uh, that makes uh, uh, the shape to be, or the transit not to be exactly trapezoidal, uh, even in uh, presence of, uh, even in absence of instrumental uh, noise. And uh, uh, so the key for uh, extracting information uh, from uh, uh, this data are uh, two. Uh, mostly, first, we need data detrending, so the correction of instrumental systematic effect. That can be done either parametrically uh, by linking uh, the observed modulations uh, or uh, temporal ramps behavior with uh, some uh, instrumental characteristics, typically pointing jitter for Spitzer or temporal ramps for Hubble data, or blind source separation method. That is uh, uh, something that I will discuss in the next slide because I work mostly with uh, them. And on the other side, we have astrophysical modeling. So important effects that uh, to account are that of the stellar limb darkening, magnetic activity, so also the presence of the spots and the uh, facula. And uh, depending on the system, uh, we can also have a significant uh, rotational effect. Uh, for example, uh, flattening of the star, gravity darkening, Rossi and McLaughlin. And uh, the, in some kind of observation, also the, plan, the, the flux from the planet itself act as a contaminant and other technical aspects. And these are all uh, uh, not necessarily everything that we need, but these are the topics in which I worked in the past uh, year. And uh, I start presenting some of my PhD work. 
uh, that uh, in which I developed a machine learning method for uh, data trending so to remove uh, instrumental systematics. And in particular, the method that uh, I used the most was based on independent component analysis, which is a statistical technique to separate uh, signals from, uh, so to separate the source signals from a mixture of them. In particular, uh, in astrophysical observation, we have some astrophysical signal coming from the transit or, or the planet or the stars. Uh, it can also be stellar activity, and we have uh, instrumental uh, effects that uh, uh, are dominant in uh, current data sets. And uh, uh, the objective is from a set of uh, observations uh, with independent component analysis, it performs a linear transform to extract the uh, individual component. So, uh, in particular, the separate the astrophysical signal from the instrumental one. And uh, uh, the key for making this uh, inversion within the IC technique is to minimize the mutual information that is a well-defined statistical uh, um, operator. And the idea is that uh, while uh, all the signals that uh, we observe uh, are somehow correlated uh, because they contain the same astrophysics and the similar instrumental effect, the source signal, so the, uh, the astrophysical one and the instrumental in itself are uh, very different characteristics. And so they are, they should be independent in uh, uh, most uh, uh, applications. And uh, uh, by using this criteria, uh, this criteria uh, essentially ICA uh, try to uh, perform, uh, to, to separate uh, these components. And uh, one particular uh, application of this technique uh, that I developed uh, during my PhD was called the pixel ICI, in which uh, instead of using multiple observations of the same system, uh, I was just uh, treating individual pixel light years, individual pixel time series as independent uh, uh, observations. Even if the flux level is very different in uh, this uh, uh, Spitzer image, uh, between the central pixel and the one on the bottom, you can see that uh, uh, they all have some hints of the transit signal at around the phase zero, plus some uh, modulations that are uh, partially correlated. And uh, uh, by performing a linear transform over multiple pixel time series, uh, we were able to extract the uh, pure transit signal from this uh, data. Before showing some results, I say, what are the advantages of this method compared to parametric techniques? Uh, one is that uh, it has a high degree of, of objectivity, uh, which is particularly important when the instrument uh, like Spitzer were not uh, calibrated for the precision uh, required by transit uh, studies, <laughs> the atmospheric studies in particular. And uh, uh, so uh, we don't have to guess uh, what are the uh, factors, uh, the instrumental factors that uh, determine uh, the systematics that we observe in the data. And uh, what was happening before in particular is that uh, different uh, uh, groups uh, using uh, different parameterization of uh, higher or lower order polynomials or using, uh, for example, uh, uh, Spitzer centroids or PSF amplitudes were getting uh, significantly different results uh, from the same data sets. And uh, uh, so using uh, a blind source separation technique uh, somehow removes the degree of objectivity uh, from the observer. And uh, it is uh, also flexible to adapt to various instrument design. In fact, uh, uh, I developed some other techniques, uh, not only the pixel ICA, uh, but uh, for example, the stripe ICA that I don't describe now, but it was specifically applied to HSTWC free scanning mode spectroscopy data. And uh, I'm trying to test some of this technique also with uh, uh, JWST data or with uh, simulated data from uh, Plato and uh, Ariel consortium. Uh, here, I just to show some of the result, uh, early results that I got with this technique. Here uh, on the left, we have a transit like you observed with Spitzer. The transit uh, occurs around here, and all the rest are instrumental modulation that have a similar amplitude for this planet. Uh, to the transit. And so they are particularly difficult to, to disentangle. 
And uh, on the right, there is the transit signal extract from this particular observation. There were in total uh, four similar observations, Q at 3.6 and 4.5 micron. And uh, the earlier analysis on the red point were showing a very different uh, transit depth from uh, one epoch to the other that uh, were attributing either to instrument variability or a strong stellar activity effect. Uh, but uh, by doing the analysis with uh, independent component analysis, I got the blue results, uh, where the difference between blue and light blue is a different limb darkening assumption that I tested. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, there is much less variability between uh, uh, visits, and uh, so uh, rolling out some uh, strong stellar uh, variability, and also less difference uh, uh, between uh, uh, wavelengths. Uh, that uh, uh, some of these data were originally interpreted as evidence for methane absorption, and uh, instead it is not evident uh, at all from uh, this flat spectrum uh, here. Uh, another example that was more, more challenging uh, it was the observation of a secondary eclipse, uh, and uh, the, the signal is, uh, as usual, the one on the left. Uh, the eclipse, it is kind of seen here at the center of the image, but uh, it is very, very hidden by noise. And on the right uh, is the extracted one. In this case, there were 10 observations of the system plus 10 simulated data sets that were uh, provided by the Spitzer IRAC uh, team uh, for the data challenge in the 2015. And uh, we tested the different techniques and based on uh, uh, some uh, uh, statistical uh, parameters that are the repeatability, cioè the variation between epochs, assuming that uh, uh, at least in the simulation, so we are sure that the astrophysics was the same. And uh, uh, it turned out that uh, the IC technique was the most uh, uh, repeatable and uh, giving the most reliable results uh, for the speeds and the trending of this system. And the more recent uh, application, uh, just to show, I, I, I showed a transit, an eclipse, and I uh, tried also on uh, face curves. And uh, uh, here are three visits uh, on the WASP-43B, which is a very interesting target uh, now being observed by JWST. And uh, again, uh, here the main uh, improvement uh, that uh, obtained with the Spitzer IC technique was that, uh, uh, for example, for the night side, uh, the night side uh, uh, temperature was highly debated in the literature. Previous uh, uh, Previous measurements uh, were giving just the upper limit uh, of two sigma that are in the panel that were also challenging to interpret uh, in terms of uh, physics, uh, expected physics for this uh, planet, while uh, the measurement that I got are somehow at higher temperature. And there have been also other analysis of the Spitzer data plus uh, recent uh, observation with JWST that uh, confirm more or less that the temperature of the planet is. Uh, or the night side is much more similar to 900, so the measurement that uh, we got, than the very first uh, estimates. Uh, so now, uh, just uh, an, uh, a way that I like to interpret this was that the first scenario uh, for uh, was 43 b was a very extreme uh, day-to-night temperature const contrast uh, that was even difficult to explain uh, with uh, uh, physical models for the planet. Uh, while uh, after this uh, correction, uh, we still have a stronger contrast in temperature, but uh, uh, much more uh, reasonable uh, based uh, on the physical models. And uh, now I stop the part about uh, the PhD work and data determining technique, and I uh, pass to the second part of the talk discussing some uh, uh, modeling of astrophysical effect uh, on which I worked in particular uh, limb darkening. Uh, so I developed uh, one uh, Python package that is open source and is called uh, Exotetis. Uh, it is also PIP installable. And uh, originally it was designed just to calculate uh, stellar limb darkening coefficients, uh, uh, similar to many other packages that uh, also calculate uh, limb darkening coefficients. But uh, the novelty uh, in this package was that uh, uh, it was optimized to give the best coefficient for transits because uh, uh, some uh, earlier study that uh, 
uh, we could discuss privately, but there is, uh, I mean, I don't want to uh, bore uh, too much. Uh, basically, found that uh, uh, it is different uh, uh, if you wanted to optimize a stellar limb darkening profile from uh, an intensity profile at a given angles, or if you wanted to estimate this from transit observations. Uh, basically, because uh, these two uh, kind of data are sensitive to different portions of the disk. And uh, uh, the coefficient calculated with this uh, code uh, were optimized for transit observations and guarantee a precision below 10 ppm, while in other cases you can have biases of uh, a few hundred, uh, up to a few hundred ppm, depending on the fitting technique used. That uh, do not depend on the stellar model, but just on the, the way how the coefficients are extracted from that model. And then uh, I added uh, some other functions, and uh, in particular, the boats package can be used as a star planet spectral simulator, similar to Pandexo, uh, to reproduce, for example, JWST simulated data, or it could be used for aerial data, provided that uh, it has the instrumental response. And, uh, and also for uh, some uh, other astrophysical effects uh, that uh, I will probably uh, briefly present uh, in the next slides. And uh, so in general, this package is intended to use for uh, any kind of exoplanet mission, like Ariel, Plato, Keops, and James Webb uh, in this uh, slide. And uh, recently, I used uh, this package to calculate the official grid of the and coefficients for the Plato instrument, uh, which is uh, still a uh, work in progress pending uh, updates uh, of the astrophysical models. Uh, this was obtained uh, with Mark's model. And uh, in particular, I'm uh, the leader of the Plato limb darkening working package, uh, so responsible to deliver the final uh, limb darkening coefficients uh, uh, that will be used by the pipeline uh, of the mission, as well as uh, gravity darkening uh, and uh, Doppler boosting coefficients. Uh, and I also calculated the uh, tables of limb darkening coefficients uh, for the RL instruments uh, with different uh, uh, libraries of spectral models. And the software uh, Exotetis was also used, uh, was also implemented by some uh, data dependent pipelines like Heraclis and Cascade that have been largely used for the analysis of HST and even uh, JWST data. Uh, as I said, another application of this package was to produce uh, synthetic uh, uh, transmission spectra of exoplanet atmospheres. And uh, uh, I uh, used this in uh, several uh, uh, discovery paper or mass measurement paper uh, for the Carmenes and the Muscat Q consortia, as well as uh, uh, from time to time for other external uh, um, collaborations. And uh, this is one of the most uh, uh, interesting uh, benchmark uh, planet that uh, we recently discovered uh, with Carmenes and uh, Muscatiu that uh, for sure will be also observed by JWST. I, I don't know if uh, with our proposal or someone else, but uh, uh, it has uh, definitely high transmission uh, uh, spectroscopy metrics. Uh, so it is one of the most favorable rocky planets for atmospheric characterization. And, uh, Okay, and another aspect uh, on which uh, I'm uh, working uh, is uh, stellar magnetic activity, and uh, I'm leader of a sub-working package uh, within the Ariel Consortium that is called uh, Activity Correction for Planetary Spectra. Here are some images taken from uh, a recent paper of uh, uh, Alex Thompson that is based at UCL, uh, still under review, uh, but uh, available in the archive, in which uh, uh, basically uh, we can see the difference if we neglect uh, the star spots uh, in an exoplanet spectrum, we can get a significant bias that uh, in infrared wavelength looks like, like just like an offset, but uh, it has uh, much uh, more impact in the morphology uh, at the in the visible, let's say, uh, at wavelength shorter than uh, one micron. And uh, Without entering into detail, uh, I uh, also uh, experience in the modeling uh, uh, light cures of uh, rapid rotators, uh, having analyzed the Kepler data of uh, KOI 15. Uh, it is a very, um, very rapid uh, rotator system uh, with strong uh, gravity darkening effects. 
and uh, calculating the gravity darkening coefficients for the plateau mission, and also uh, modeling the rossi metonian effect in uh, observation brought both from space and uh, ground, actually mostly from ground-based instruments. And uh, another effect in which we work is the contamination of the, uh, the so exoplanet self and phase blend effect that was part of the thesis of Marie-Martin Lagarde at the CO, COA in France. And uh, uh, in particular, this is uh, uh, just when we look at the transit spectroscopy, we neglect the emission from the planet that is much uh, um, cooler than the star. Uh, but uh, uh, in some cases, uh, it can introduce some biases. And so we quantify this effect for photometry and the spectroscopy and uh, uh, suggest how to uh, correct for it. And uh, recently, I also worked in a paper on uh, studying the effect of temporal beaming, uh, particularly for phase curves, because uh, phase curves observed with the Spitzer and even with JWST have an extremely rapid cadence of seconds or fractions of seconds, and they last for days. So it is a large amount of data. And so it is uh, uh, important to know how much can we be in, uh, can we be in them to fasten uh, their analysis and the data storage as well. And uh, um, the last uh, uh, slide of this is uh, uh, I also worked uh, not only on exoplanet atmosphere, but also on uh, discovery or validation of exoplanet within uh, Muscat. In this case, I uh, led this paper that uh, was recently accepted and it is currently in press with the discovery of two potentially ultra short period planets around the dwarfs. I say rediscovery because uh, uh, simultaneously with our uh, paper, another paper appeared in the archive that was also including the same two targets, but we use uh, uh, in the different uh, technique and uh, added also some radial velocity measurements uh, that they were not uh, present in the other study. And uh, now I pass to the last part uh, of my talk that is the more more recent activity, even if some of the previous slides were also quite recent, uh, which is the synergies between low and high resolution spectroscopy that uh, I think uh, will be very important uh, uh, starting from now uh, with uh, JWST and uh, uh, Ariel and the plateau mission. And uh, I try to quickly convince you why. Uh, so, uh, Briefly, when we look at the low resolution data from space, we are used to observe just uh, uh, some time series uh, at multiple wavelengths uh, that uh, can, can be either photometric or calculated in uh, wavelength bins. So, but the treatment is very similar. They are affected, uh, different wavelengths can be affected by uh, different uh, beam darkening. You can see in the red wavelengths, it is flatter, uh, while we have more V shaped uh, in the uh, uh, UV or uh, visible, and uh, we have a very well, a very good measurements of the spectral continuum uh, outside of the transit, and uh, they are mostly affected by limb darkening and stellar activity. Uh, while uh, observations at high resolution are typically uh, based on very different concepts, so they uh, instead of analyzing light years, we observe the spectra at high resolution for measuring similar, essentially the same that we use for radial velocity measurements. But uh, uh, we uh, try to identify in these uh, spectra also evidence of planetary absorption, but uh, many other effects appear that are not uh, important at low resolution, such as the distortion due to the rossi metonian effect, for example, uh, but they are less affected by stellar activity or limb darkening, for example. So they uh, have a very uh, sensitive to different uh, contamination signal, but also sensitive to different physics. For example, uh, uh, Doppler shift due to atmospheric wind that is very difficult to get uh, at uh, low resolution. And uh, also uh, at low resolution, we measure just broad uh, molecular features and patterns instead of high resolution we can identify the spe spectral absorption lines, so a uh, proper fingerprint of the molecule that is more uh, unique. And uh, uh, one paper in which I worked 
was uh, uh, based on uh, uh, this, a debate about the presence of sodium in uh, HDQ 9458B, which is one of the most uh, iconic of Jupiter, with uh, exactly the first uh, detection of an atmosphere by Charbonneau in 2002, uh, based on HST data. Uh, but uh, recent uh, uh, analysis with uh, Espresso and uh, also Arps North uh, and uh, Carmenes, but uh, I'm reporting Espresso because it, it was having the highest quality data set, uh, were not finding any evidence uh, of uh, this absorption signal, uh, but uh, still they were finding uh, uh, some uh, uh, signal around the sodium doublet that was interpreted as the rossi metolin effect due to the presence of sodium in the star. And uh, uh, so what I did was a very simple uh, uh, approach to simulate uh, uh, using the same um, model, the same uh, framework, uh, the low and high resolution data set, uh, using a much thinner grid than uh, what is shown in this uh, illustrative picture. Uh, to reproduce, uh, so each uh, cell here is Doppler shifted and accounts also for stellar in darkening. And uh, I reproduced both transit uh, life curves uh, on the left, and uh, on the right, uh, the absorption signal uh, from the, the rossiter meconin signal with or without absorption uh, that were calculated in uh, Nuria's paper, Casa Sayedaris uh, 2022. And uh, basically, uh, I, it is uh, quite difficult to, to enter into the techniques, but uh, uh, if uh, we look at the detail, uh, what uh, um, we found is that there exists a range of models that is compatible with both observations that are either without sodium or with sodium, but uh, at a lower temperature than the equilibrium temperature, which is uh, possible to have at the terminator. And uh, also uh, investigated the presence of clouds, because the clouds are usually responsible for uh, dumping at the features in low resolution observations, but their effect is much less important in high resolution. And so we understand that they cannot be the cause of the discrepancy between uh, uh, the two data sets. And uh, so this is the summary of just what I just said about these uh, planets. And uh, it is uh, a kind of problem, uh, this of the overlap uh, between uh, uh, rossi mercolin and uh, atmospheric signal that, that does not happen on all planetary systems, but uh, the, we identified uh, a few dozen of planets uh, which have overlapping signals. So we can apply the same uh, Bayesian framework uh, uh, to their analysis. And uh, one more recent uh, application uh, that uh, I mentioned is uh, uh, on synergies with the JWST data. Uh, I was a I am still a part of the JWST Transiting Exoplanet Community Every Release Science Program. Uh, we measured the uh, one the the most uh, uh, complete spe uh, transmission spectrum of, of an exoplanet that covers from the visible um, 0 0.4 micron up to 5 micron, uh, observing, uh, identifying different molecules. But uh, uh, there are still, uh, uh, despite the super high quality of uh, this data set, there are still some uh, doubtful uh, ident uh, results. For example, uh, uh, yeah, Hidden in this data set around uh, uh, three micron, uh, there is uh, a small, uh, I know, around to show here. Well, the, the yellow feature on the right, around four micron, uh, that is uh, a small bump attributed to SO2. But uh, as you can imagine, uh, given it is a, a small bump that you observe in a, a spectra with multiple bumps, it is difficult to, to be totally sure that this molecule is SO2. It is not expected at chemical equilibrium. So uh, the modelers uh, hypothesize some photochemistry to explain uh, this uh, uh, detection. But uh, uh, still, uh, my, uh, I submitted an ISO proposal to observe this uh, region uh, with uh, CLIRES at higher resolution to actually uh, identify whether it is uh, uh, really SO2. Uh, by using the cross correlation technique. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, another uh, thing is the CH4 methane, that uh, it does not have a very strong bump uh, at uh, around the three micron, uh, the light blue 
uh, molecule, but uh, uh, it can still be identified uh, an upper limit at higher resolution. And uh, one example of this is that, uh, for example, in one of these data set, uh, there was uh, CO was not identified at, uh, at the original uh, resolution analysis of the JWST data, but was later identified with the cross correlation technique. So it is really possible that um, these uh, observations are complementary and uh, can help to uh, determine the full chemical inventory of uh, a planetary atmosphere. <clears throat> so I uh, summarize now what I presented uh, in this uh, talk. So I worked on uh, uh, development of data determining pipelines, in particular blind source separation method uh, with application to Spitzer and double data up to now. Uh, and uh, some experience with astrophysical modeling, in particular stellar limb darkening, uh, uh, magnetic activity. And uh, I'm responsible for two working packages for the planetary emissions on these two topics. And uh, other application of a uh, software uh, that uh, I developed and is uh, open source. And the most uh, recent uh, project that I'm developing between uh, IEC and uh, Chalmers University uh, on the synergies between low and high resolution spectroscopy with uh, immediate application uh, to JWST early release science data, uh, but uh, will uh, uh, be very useful also for the aerial data uh, for um, similar reasons. Okay, that's it. Thank you for uh, time. Thank you very much for this uh, talk. So now the talk is open for uh, questions. Please, uh, in the room, if there is any question. Thanks, uh, Giuseppe. OK, any questions for Giuseppe now? Uh, if you don't have any mind right now, I have uh, thousands. So <laughs> I have a list here. but. Uh, Okay, um, thanks, um, Giuseppe. Uh, could you go back to your contribution to modeling of astrophysical effects? Uh, in particular, could you explain a bit more what you did for modeling Rosette and Laughlin effects okay. in, your, in your work? Uh, yes, so this uh, uh, is uh, an example. Uh, we have a, a star uh, uh, with the noun uh, uh, DNI. So uh, the two hemispheres here are uh, Doppler shifted on the blue or red side. And, uh, uh, and there is also included the limb darkening effect. So basically, uh, I take uh, a stellar uh, spectrum template uh, with uh, result in uh, angularly result. So that it accounts for the spectral limb darkening, for the limb darkening. I, measure the uh, projected uh, velocity uh, of each cell and apply a Doppler shift. And by summing the contributes from uh, a large grid, um, I think at least 300 by 300 pixels, but uh, uh, it would be better uh, even more. It becomes computationally challenging. Uh, basically, I get a spectrum that includes the uh, rotational um, the impact of rotation. And then uh, when a planet passes in front of it, uh, I occult some of these pixels. Uh, in this study, I don't consider the planet just uh, as a simple circle, but I also account for the atmosphere. So depending on so that the planet, so some pixels are totally occulted by the planet, some others are occulted or not, not occulted depending on the wavelength. Uh, and uh, uh, so this uh, uh, includes for the atmosphere. By doing uh, this, uh, uh, by doing this uh, study, basically uh, it is important whether we stay in uh, the stellar reference frame or in the planet reference frame. Uh, so we have to uh, bring uh, um, all spectra in the same uh, uh, reference. It is not very important at low resolution, but uh, at uh, it is important at high resolution where, for example, the, this is uh, the, on the right panel are the spectrum. So the F in flux during the transit. So some, some of uh, uh, the full transit from the first contact to the last contact point. 
uh, divided the out of transit flux that is not um, affected by the planet and uh, uh, minus one uh, in percentage. And uh, uh, if uh, considering that the simulated star contains sodium, uh, the red signal is just uh, the signal that we would obtain uh, due to the rossi Metholin effect. And then uh, uh, if uh, we assume that uh, there is uh, some sodium in the planetary atmosphere, uh, we start uh, getting a uh, dip at the center, which are the other models. But uh, uh, if we assume uh, uh, solar abundances and uh, equilibrium temperature of the planet, we will get the orange dip that uh, uh, we would have detected uh, uh, with uh, espresso. Uh, adding clouds uh, does not change much. Uh, I don't know if I can point it, but it would give the gray point. It is a very little difference, but uh, I. Uh, but it is uh, uh, possible that uh, at a lower temperature that uh, are definitely possible in the atmosphere because the uh, temperature is not of constant with the angle. And uh, uh, we can have a much smaller peak that uh, if we compare it with the uh, noise in the espresso data, maybe not uh, detected. Also because uh, there have been some other mod modulations uh, due to the instrument that were also removed. So it can be easily masked this signal. Now, I think that one question that we have is that the amplitude of the signal does not seem to match at all the espresso uh, result. And uh, this is actually true. We decided to, to leave this like this because making more simulation is very, very time consuming for now. But uh, uh, if you try a slightly different atmospheric model, for example, a slightly different stellar model, uh, for example, without the uh, local thermodynamic equilibrium assumption, uh, we observed uh, it had uh, deeper uh, sodium lines. And uh, just by having deeper sodium lines, you can change uh, the amplitude of the signal. Also, link darkening can have a small effect on uh, the signal. So basically, uh, what we investigated in the study was the shape uh, the, and the variation on the shape due to the absorption, but not to the absolute amplitude. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, having uh, the correct spectrum with the true absolute amplitude uh, would give uh, more, uh, probably uh, some more constraint on the abundances. Another <coughs> thing is that, uh, uh, for example, here I present a different temperature, but uh, uh, we also tested the different abundances. For example, can we assume that uh, it is not a lower temperature, but it is uh, uh, one tenth solar abundances? Mm -hmm. And uh, in general, with very extreme examples, yes, it is possible. But uh, uh, essentially, this feature is much more sensitive to temperature than abundances. Changing by one order of magnitude was not significantly affecting. Uh, I'm, here I'm talking of abundances in the planetary atmosphere. Uh, was not significantly changing this signal. And it can be applied on different lines, for example, magnesium. Where is the range in wavelength where we can uh, apply your simulations? Uh... So this uh, really depends on the spectrum that uh, on the stellar spectrum. That, uh, as long uh, as uh, I have a stellar spectrum, it can go to the ultraviolet or uh, far infrared. It doesn't matter. Um, in general, uh, this effect is important for at atoms, so uh, or ions. So I expect uh, visible wavelengths, and uh, it's not. Uh, it's not easy to obtain, let's say, these uh, weather dimensions. Okay. Uh, any other questions uh, for you, uh, Frank? No. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank Frank. you, Sarah, for your talk. Uh, I'm very uh, interested on in your Excel in this package. I uh, uh, was wondering which are the limits that you are using in your in the range for the temperature, metallicity, on the wavelength that you are using? Okay, so there are different uh, libraries. Uh, so there is uh, one very old uh, Atlas library that uh, is the most comprehensive, uh, go from uh, low temperatures up to 50,000 Kelvin uh, and uh, gravity. But uh, uh, I would say, given it is old, maybe it is not the most uh, accurate. Uh, but uh, the a good one, I think, is uh, Phoenix uh, libraries that uh, cover from um, 
Q thousand something uh, up to twelve thousand Kelvin. Okay, so if I understand mean well, uh, you can choose the library when yes. you are computing the inductance yes. in your calculator. Okay. Yeah, but I have a library. So, but it, it, it has to be a library that uh, is, uh, for now, it has to be a library that is already implemented. So there is uh, either Phoenix that has a large coverage, uh, or there are also Stagger models uh, pretty, uh, but they uh, cover only 4,000, 7,000. Mm -hmm. I plan to include uh, new libraries uh, when I add them. Uh, and actually, I have some that I could uh, add uh, now. Uh, and uh, one other objective that shouldn't be difficult to, is to let the user um, to use the own library. Uh, but this is not implemented uh, yet. Okay. Thank you. But sometimes I use it uh, just because I, I know I broke the code, and so I know how to trick it. Uh, I use it with my own library. But it is not uh, a user-defined function. So if you okay. need to do it, uh, I yeah. can tell you how to do it. You have to make it public as well. But it is not uh, <laughs> in the package. Okay, thank you. Hey, any other question? Um, I, I just want to remind you that Giuseppe will be here all day. Um, tomorrow you are leaving early in the morning. morning. So <laughs> probably um if you want to talk to him or you want to join us for lunch because we have one for lunch uh, you are welcome and we can discuss all the very interesting uh, topics that he has brought up uh, today here um sorry for those that are in in at home that come and join us for for lunch but uh any of you if you want to come uh yes Christine. I have to ask how is you or what do you have to do to use your machine learning approach or content analysis with other steps that are coming from the instruments to your type of cardinals or the same web uh, inspector? How much you have to tune on what you have to do? Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, the, let's say that uh, up to very recently, there was not a proper package. So one of the limitations was that uh, independent component analysis has many um, different uh, algorithms. And uh, I noted that not all of them were uh, sufficient. Uh, so I was using uh, an algorithm that only had uh, Fortran or MATLAB version. Uh, but uh, recently, a student in France uh, has uh, wrapped it into a Python. <laughs> uh, so, but, uh, so this, uh, can be available and it is relatively easy to use. But uh, at this moment, uh, it is only designed for uh, pixel like yours, so photometric observations. Uh, I mentioned that there are some uh, possibility to use with spectra. And uh, basically, this would require writing uh, a function uh, to read the data, process the data. And then uh, what uh, we have now is basically uh, the function that if you add the time series, or spectra, because it can also receive spectra as input, uh, to apply the transform. Uh, so now this is uh, fast. Um, the, the other parts are, first, the extraction of the time series or spectra, and second, the MCMC fitting. Uh, that is not automatic. So, But the transform is very fast now. It, it does not require any, um, it, it is based only on open source software, not model, and uh, typically even for a very long time series uh, with the million data points can take a few minutes. Uh, so it's uh, usable. Uh, Manuel. Um, right. Oh, thank you very much, Josepe, for the nice talk. Uh, one question about this work. <laughs> you are essentially, if I understood you right, essentially questioning the first detection of the atmosphere made by David Charbonneau from sodium on this exoplanet. So do you think that what really observed uh, can be explained by effects which are not really the presence of sodium? What is your opinion? I mean, at the end, is it there sodium or not in that atmosphere? Yes, and uh, I uh, show the result, because this is a very good question. Uh, I think that the current data are not totally conclusive. Uh, we can definitely rule out uh, sodium at uh, solar abundances and equilibrium temperature. And uh, there are uh, some uh, uh, 
possibility that the other effects that are so for example if we let um, people the same data with uh, three limb darkening uh, with the significance that was at four sigma can decrease below three sigma uh, so there is a possibility that there is no sodium at all uh, but the most likely uh, solution that uh, I have from the current data is that I think that probably there is sodium, uh, but uh, uh, with some dampened feature and uh, with uh, a temperature at the terminator of uh, 700 or 1000. And let's say that uh, this is the best likely solution that they get. Uh, but, uh, but it is also consistent with no sodium. Okay. So, I have a further question. Yeah, um, it's about your last point about the using the low and high resolution. Yeah. Uh, was it, do you plan to do retrieval of abundances from the combination of both things? Yes, okay. Uh, I think that I have a slide. Okay. Uh, yes, this is uh, some uh, work that I'm uh, uh, doing now that uh, is uh, difficult and may take some time. But uh, uh, on uh, not using uh, uh, cross correlation just for detection of the molecule, but also for determining abundances. And there, there have been some recent papers that also were making uh, cross correlation with a model with multiple molecules, for example. And uh, so uh, Yes, the, the, the idea is to, uh, to implement some cross, proper cross correlation retrievals. You know, there are some, uh, it is not fully original. There are some trials now based on grids, uh, but not a proper Bayesian uh, framework. And uh, this is what I would like to implement uh, now, in particular with Taurex uh, through the UCL people that are uh, managing the Taurex code. But uh, I no idea now how long uh, this uh, can, uh, how complicated this can be. I discussed with uh, some of them, uh, but uh, it may take months, one year. <laughs> As you mean the correlation by itself, or just in something like uh, uh, not to, 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 minimizing to have uh, it implemented in the tablets, for example, as the proper uh, uh, retrieval. Because, for example, now uh, what I'm exploring uh, is, uh, uh, in some cases, different models uh, have an impact on the peak. In other cases, we have uh, some effects on the tails, but I don't know if it is uh, uh, how to interpret it, essentially. So I'm running some uh, grids of cross-correlation retrievals for testing this effect. Once this is uh, fully calibrated, I don't think that the implementation in Taurex will be very, very difficult. But uh, I'm not the person who is implementing it after in the package. So, uh, okay, good, thank you. So, and, I mean, I'm, I'm an expert on this field, so my question refers mostly with the, uh, the method you use the whole time, or mostly is the independent component analysis. Is this the same as the principal component analysis method? Okay, no, uh, but it's a good question because many. Uh, so it is a frequent question also for this one. I had uh, some slides, uh, I think. But uh, essentially, the main difference uh, is that uh, uh, principal component analysis, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. So they are both linear transformation of the observations and try to find an orthogonal basis of components. But uh, uh, principal component analysis try to find uncorrelated components which means that the mean value of the product uh, is equal to the product of the two mean values. And these uh, just use uh, up to second order statistical estimators. Uh, while uh, uh, ICA uh, use a more stronger concept of, in which any function of the two variables uh, are uncorrelated. And uh, this is used, uh, uh, this requires higher order statistics. Um, then, uh, uh, so this is very qualitative uh, uh, difference. And that's, uh... well, that's enough. More detailed yeah. mathematics. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Okay. Oh, and uh, yes. 
Thanks, yeah. Giuseppe. Um, maybe it's a little bit naive question, but the, the technique that you developed to remove the LM effect that I never know how to pronounce rock in mm -hmm. whatever effect, <laughs> but from espresso data, right? Yeah. Uh, is this technique uh, easily, and I suppose it's not easy, but to apply to other cases? Just, uh, for example, putting as input uh, another star. Yeah, yes, uh, I did not use, uh, for example, the uh, espresso response for making uh, this. It is just um, one stellar spectrum. And, uh, this uh, is, is uh, flexible. Is yeah, it? yes, it is. Uh... <laughs> the complicated thing is that you need a very thin grid, uh, spatial grid for the star. And uh, if you have a high resolution spectra, uh, it is uh, time consuming, but especially around consuming. Uh, more than uh, time consuming. And uh, the technique is it available? Because I think there's a student, uh, uh, it is available for the espresso community. Or not? Okay, no, I did not make a package for that. I have uh, some script uh, that I could pass, I pass to some people the script, but it's very basic. It is not uh, complicated, but uh, yes, uh, I did not make a proper package. I think it is easy but to you use. Yes. So related to this, related to this, is there any specific material spectrum for this? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, really, I have resolution. So it can be run uh, with uh, any resolution that uh, you want. Of course, uh, it has to be a resolution that is enough for the instrument uh, that uh, you uh, should be a, a little bit higher. Let's say at least a factor of five higher than uh, the resolution that you want to analyze. Okay, thank you for all your questions. I don't see any more questions here in the room. No questions uh, online. So, okay, we thank you, the speaker again. Okay. Thank you.